Thanks so much, Gary. It's my pleasure now, my absolute pleasure to introduce to you uh, my dear friend. And actually, a little while ago, I told him that he was actually my brother now, um, Joe Cloutier. Joe uh, co-developed Inner City High School in Edmonton and has spent the past 30 years working with Edmonton's marginalized urban, indigenous and other youth in programs for peace and justice. And Joe, I will turn it over to you. Okay, I will go ahead. So as you know from Rava, I'm Joe and uh, thank you Rava and thank you to everyone for participating and for allowing me to be in your company. And I really am honored to do that. So you heard about in the podcast, the early work of the, the drama, drama, I guess the early drama work. And that, that work resulted in some of the youth saying that they, what they needed to move forward was a school. So of course we had been thinking of doing this, that opening a school anyway, and we opened inner city high school. Um, with a few members of our drama group and uh, a couple of their friends. And it was we opened it up as a kind of private school, so not connected to, to the public school system because that would be impossible. We'd be buried in a long list of requirements for the and, and deep into a bureaucracy that wouldn't work for the, the marginalized indigenous urban youth that we work with. So, um, but we, we realized pretty quickly that, that uh, just by opening a school and saying, here you are and here's the books, wasn't gonna magically bring rainbows over their lives and over the building and solve all the problems. We needed more. Many youth were in desperate situations, lacking resources, living in unsafe, unstable uh, accommodation, housing, we needed a wraparound school that was comprehensive enough to supply whatever supports we could to help create as uh, create the conditions for pedagogy to exist. The state that they were in, it was not, it was just worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, what am I going to eat tonight, how can you go to school with that. So we created the Inner City Youth Development Association as the umbrella organization for um, our two programs. So Inner City High School is our independent academic and arts-based school. And the Youth Engagement Program reaches out to, as this thing works, to youth on the street level uh, to engage them in our programming. Our focus at this point is on stabilizing the youth, youth from the uncertainties of street life and the associated habits, because uh, you can't just say, come on in from the street, doors open, here's some food, now get to work, go to class. Because there's just a whole, li living on the street requires a different set of skills that are not accepted by the dominant society, but you need them to survive in that kind of violent environment. So since this session is intended to be engaging and not just me talking, although I know you'll be really disappointed about that, um, there will be a couple of opportunities to participate, one part way through and one at the end of this presentation. I'll present a serious social issue, social problem that is active in Canada at this time. It involves the abuse and dehumanization of a marginalized population, specifically indigenous women and girls. Oh, why doesn't everything work like it's supposed to? Uh, the powerful image of a hanging red dress, which will appear later in the presentation, and the handprint across the mouth have come to symbolize the missing, murdered Indigenous women and girls, and to represent the thousands of women silenced. But first, a bit of background to this strategy that demands that we don't re remain silent. 
As the session as the session proceeds, I ask you as educators to write a few lines in chat stating how you might respond to this or a similar situation with your students. Towards the end of the presentation, we'll read out as many responses as time permits. That I wrote, that part I wrote before I realized how this was going to roll. So that won't be necessary because they'll be in chat and you can read them yourself. So I then, re after that, I'll, I'll present an example from a of a response from one of our classes, for a response to this particular issue. In 2015, Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission heard the voices and intergenerational impact of colonial policies on Indigenous people. This commission was the seed for the 2019 National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Women and Girls. Survivors of violence spoke about its surrounding context marked by multi-generational and intergenerational trauma. They spoke of their marginalization in the form of poverty, insecure housing, homelessness, and barriers to education. They spoke of the lack of employment opportunities and healthcare and cultural supports. Elders and knowledge keepers spoke to specific colonial and patriarchal policies that displaced women from their traditional roles in the communities, in governance, and their diminished status in society, which left them vulnerable to violence. The missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls were also mothers, daughters, sisters, aunties, cousins, and grandmothers. Some were students completing post-secondary education, such as Loretta Saunders, an Inuit woman, murdered at age 26. Loretta was completing her honors thesis on this very issue at the time she went missing. Others were only children, such as 15-year-old Tina Fontaine. Tina was a ward of the child welfare system at the time she went missing and was later found sexually abused, murdered, and floating in the river. This violence is faced by Indigenous women and girls from all walks of life across the country. Last week, we held a vigil in our school for Nikki Frenchman, a former student who has been missing since last July and feared to have met the same fate as thousands of missing Indigenous women and girls found murdered and sexually abused. As I mentioned earlier, we do our best to support youth involved in street life. When they first come to us, you may wonder, well, we do our best to support youth involved in street life. You may wonder why are they on the street and not at home with their parents? Well, between 80 and 90% of the young people we work with are marginalized Indigenous youth, age 15 to 24, mostly without parental support. Many have been apprehended from their homes at a young age and placed in foster care, often moving from home to home and school to school. On average, our students have been in from a low of 10 to a high of 27 schools to reach the mid elementary level. That's grades three and five. Now you think these people are 17, on average 17 to 19 years old, um, been on the street, have no education, but, uh, but are intelligent enough and resourceful enough to survive without resources. So it, it, it takes uh, intelligence and it takes skills to do that. But formally, between grade three and five, and even less in mathematics. This negative relationship with schools has a long history. As in other places, the youth suffer from the impact of colonialism and the residential school system, where children were apprehended from their parents and placed in these schools often far from their homes and often never to return. 
Attempts were made in the schools to strip the children of their culture and language and assimilate them into the lower levels of the dominant society. Many children suffered physical, sexual, and psychological abuse in an ongoing 100-year pattern. The latent impact of this violence and trauma helped create the self-destruction, systemic racism, and interge intergenerational trauma that impacts our students and society today. Poor Indigenous women and girls are dehumanized and become prey to satisfy the sexual appetites of the hunter. Elders and many others are no longer silent and speaking out about this assault on their human rights. This unspeakable violence against Indigenous women and girls happens within a broad context shaped by colonialism, racism, and marginalization. The devastation caused by this disappearance, rape, and murder of a parent's child or a child's mother are so prevalent in the Indigenous community that the cries for justice can no longer be ignored. These red dresses hanging at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights signifies an acknowledgement of this tragedy. Now, at this point in the presentation, I was going to take a few minutes to review the comments, but I'll just kind of pause for a, mo for a minute or so and uh, give you an opportunity, if you care to, to uh, put in some suggestions. And I'll follow, I'll follow this up with a, uh, an example of one of our small steps in the slow work of educating for peace. There's many, I'm, I'm just highlighting one, there's many other things around going on around this particular issue and others. Um, but this is what I kind of was able to document to present to you. So the work I'm going to sh will show you is a yet untitled and in this rough stage hip hop song recorded in our music studio. Hip hop or rap can be a form of narrative development and be part of a pedagogy of peace and justice. So it'll begin with a recording of a newscast about missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, then the song follows the newscast. I translated or formalized as little of the slang as I thought necessary for understanding. So now I'm just going to pull this up and, and get, get started. Uh, so there's the newscast. Uh, and I, so I'm going to show the lyrics as the song goes. So hopefully you can understand it. Red dresses blowing in the wind at this vigil in Chelsea, Quebec are a sad reminder of Canada's missing and murdered Indigenous women. Vigils around the country Monday are honoring these women's lives. We're letting the families know that they're not alone. In Alberta, Natawawaki English organized a march in honor of her daughters. One of them brutally murdered in 2015. Joey's body was dismembered and spread around Calgary, Alberta, Crescent Heights Parks, and the landfills. To this day, Joey's limbs still sit in the landfills. Look, I'm sick of women going missing, dying every day. The government and listen, got me tripping on another case. Yeah, I think about my mother when I'm gonna see her face. Hoping every woman stay alive, will and say I'm sick of women going missing, dying every day. The government and listen, got me tripping on another case. Yeah, I think about my mother when I'm gonna see her face. Hoping every woman stay alive, will and say I see a lot of women sleeping, turning up the gangs. See the younger generation doing everything today. Popping pills and sibling names, take away no pain. Never ever trust nobody. Everybody gotta take it different ways. Even remember taking native women clean out the street. When she was just cold, yo, needing someone to sleep. Now I'm sitting on this mic telling people the story. I hope you learn from this on the way to keep going. Look, I'm sick of women going missing, dying every day. The government and listen got me 
be tripping on another gig here Thinking about my mother when I'm gonna see her face Hoping every woman stay alive will and save I'm sick of women going mad and dying Every day the government and listen Got me tripping on another gig here Thinking about my mother when I'm gonna see her face Hoping every woman stay alive will and save Shut up to my niches down in the native nation Been through everything bro These lives are complicated If we have a dream get the time to go and chase it Got us moves to create it from the deep inside my face it This the way I keep on moving life I never lose them when I make it Mainly coming cause I'm getting so I'm moving this the way I keep a moving left and never lose them when I make a million come and cause I get a song moving eight. Hey, rest in peace to all the ones from under the ground. Why ain't anybody noticed anything until now? It was always white man against all of us browns. I'ma keep on spinning facts until it's my last round. Rest in peace to all the ones found under the ground. Why ain't anybody noticed anything until now? It was always white man against all of us browns. It was always white man against all of us browns. Hey, hey, sick of women going missing, dying every day. The government and listen got me tripping on another case. Yeah, think about my mother when I'm gonna see her face. Hoping every woman stay alive will and save I'm sick of women going missing, dying every day The government and listen got me tripping on another case Here, yeah, think about my mother when I'm gonna see her face Hoping every woman stay alive will and save Thank you Now, we had, um, I just gotta make, I'm gonna, I guess I'll stop the share at this point And hope I don't mess anything up uh is that is that okay did i yep you did that well joe do you want to turn on your camera so we can actually see your face i didn't know my camera was turned off but uh you, you know, we asked that sharing turns it off there i am how do i look i'm okay brilliant now, we we had an issue with that maybe you can help us out with because at the end of the song it says it was always white white men against all of us brown and there was a bit of controversy about because they're going to that song will be produced it's going to it's going to be on youtube and there's going to be a video with it like that's kind of the idea so uh, it'll be shined up and not quite so rough but some people wanted to take those lines it's always white men against all of us browns take those lines out to put it on youtube others thought well no they could they could stay in and i'm so i'm just wondering what what do you think do you think that those lines should stay in that when they put it on youtube or do you think that those lines should go up that is my question i think I, yep. i'm gonna just jump in uh and say i think um there it's it's a really difficult choice to make because um if it's going to go up on so on on the internet um that sort of invites a lot of really hateful response mm -hmm. um on the other hand there's a reality there that needs to be represented i might want to change it to it's always the the white system or the dominant system rather than white men but that would be me it's always it's always the system against all of us brown yeah it. yeah is there any any other suggestions or i also marked my phone to to time myself but i forgot to start it so i'm not sure how i'm doing with time um, I think, uh, Joe, that you can go for about two more minutes, if that's okay with you. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. So, um, I don't, the only thing I can say is to just to thank you very much and, and uh, any, any comments you have around that white versus brown problem, uh, we welcome them in the chat and we'll take everything into consideration. It is a it is a very difficult issue, and uh, uh, it's it has only recently, uh, in the past few years, come to light. But it's been going on for a number of years. Um, there's even a highway in northern, a little bit north of where I live, called the Highway of Tears, and it's in a remote area. And uh, women and young women would hitchhike from one town to another to get supplies or whatever they needed to do. And so many disappeared along that highway the high, that, that had got the name, the Highway of Tears. 
It was just bodies found in the bush all down the road. People picked up uh, while they're hitchhiking. So again, thank you very much for, um, for allowing me to present. Joe, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I just want to say that that uh, one of our, our very dear friends who is from Mexico, uh, uh, Monica Acevedo, is not with us today because she's actually participating in uh, a demonstration in Mexico. And a lot of the work that they have been doing there has been also around the issue of of murdered and missing women. So I think there's some conversations that we need to be having across our borders here about these same issues and um, about the, the ways that we can uh, address them. And 